Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them. They were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent, and in those days told no one any of the things they had seen. On the next day, when they came down from the mountain, a great crowd met him. Just then a man from the crowd shouted, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son. He is my only child. Suddenly a spirit seizes him, and all at once he shrieks. It convulses him until he foams at the mouth. It mauls him and would scarcely leave him alone. I beg you, the disciples, to cast him out, but they could not. Jesus answered, You faithless and perverse generation, how much longer must I be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. While he was coming, common, the demon dashed him to the ground in convulsions. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. And all were astounded at the greatness of God. The word of God for the people. This hymn 188. Some years ago, I can't recall how many of them, but I went to hear the author of this in lecture in Halifax at the Atlantic School of Theology. Thomas Trover taught preaching at Denver Theological Seminary, and he was a flute player at some we some reed instrument in the Denver Symphony Orchestra. And a hymn like that. And this is one of his hymns. Now, the tune may not be that familiar, but it doesn't take on the truth. But the words are exactly of us, the story you just heard. But number 186, swiftly past the clouds of glory. I'm just, uh, just going to do the whole verse for the intro because, as you said, it, I'm, I'm, not fast. I'm just going to I'm just gonna do the whole verse for the intro because I, just, I don't think this one's familiar either. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat>
this in 2 Corinthians and Luke, we encounter three explosive moments when the holiness of God changes things. It is not as evident, perhaps, to the naked eye in 2 Corinthians as it is in the other two, but nevertheless is there. Moses up on the mountain, conversing with God. Mount Sinai, the excited. And when we pick up the story today, which began some time before this, the 29th verse, Moses is coming down from the mountain carrying the two tablets, stone, covenant, commandments, and walking toward the people of Israel, including Aaron. And his face is shining unbeknown to him, reflecting the glory of the God to whom he had spoken with on the mountain. And in a sense, his light has now taken on a dangerous shine to light. Because, as the text says, he had been talking with God face to face. You may recall some years ago, the night before he was assassinated, the late Dr. Martin Luther King spoke at a Pentecostal church in Memphis. And here at the end of the sermon that he gave, these are the words he said. We've got some difficult days ahead, but it doesn't matter with me now, because I've been to the mountaintop, and I don't mind. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. <coughs> I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain top. And I looked over, and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that as a people, we will go to the promised land. And so I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Moses, Martin Luther King, Jr., seen the glory of the Lord and are no longer afraid. Like Moses, Martin Luther King, Changed and he is free, free of that. Now that is a holy moment, a glimpse of God's glory which breaks down the wall between heaven and earth. So even when we affirm in our time that God is present, even if we cannot see it clearly, we are free from the despair of earth alone. And only. So Jesus takes Peter, James, and John with him to the mountain to pray. And as he prays, and they watch and get sleepy, they're wide, not wide awake, but awake enough to see that he's changed, his face is shining, his clothes are turning white. And there they see Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus, talking about his going to Jerusalem to face the cross. And so the disciples are enamored with this and the speaking of the three of them. And Peter, of course, always putting his foot in his mouth says, well, let's put up two new congregations here. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Jesus will have none of it. And so we go back now. Remember in these two stories what, what happens when they do go down. The ministry that God is calling his people to do is carried out. The first thing that happens when Jesus comes down, there's a crowd and there's a man with a sick son. 
and Jesus cures him and tells us in Luke the disciples could not. So ministry follows this moment of glory. Now, those two stories stand apart. Paul, in his second letter to the Corinthians, I think, takes these two stories and he turns them into the context for the Corinthian church to live by. He is speaking, that is Paul, to a church that is struggling. It's a church that struggles, as you read the Corinthian letters, with sexuality, with money, and with leadership. They probably struggle with other things too, but those are key. And there's difficulties. Not getting along with one another, fighting. So Paul uses the backdrop of those two stories of Moses and Jesus on the mountain to basically tell them how they are to follow Jesus. He gives them, if you like, the bedrock of their faith, and that is the entrance of the holiness of God into God's people. Paul says it is the holiness of God that's come to human life in Christ. And he says the church must always be telling this truth. The stories of Jesus, because these stories reveal the glory of God. Paul is telling the church in Corinth to practice daily the memory of Jesus and let it be fully present. Now, listen to what he says. And all of us with unveiled faces, seeing the glory of the Lord as though reflected in a mirror, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord of Spirit. Moses had to put a veil on, Paul says, not you. Christ has removed the veil. It is through the holiness of God that God acts, and the Bible insists that you and I are made for God's holiness. And it's that holiness that makes us truly human. He sees, that is, Paul sees the Christian life as living close enough to God, attentive enough to God, that the presence of God will change us, will heal us, will make us whole, and make us more and more like God, from image one degree to another. So God is at work and we are being acted upon, transformed from one degree to another. Yet, we're faced with the temptation to do otherwise. Faced with the temptation not to do what Martin Luther said, Martin Luther King, to do the will of God, but to do something else. That's the temptation of Control of wanting more, of greediness, etc., etc., which will become significant next Sunday, the first Sunday of Lent, when we face the story of the temptations. But Paul adds these words, therefore, since it is by God's mercy that we are engaged in this ministry, we do not lose heart. It gets tiring, really to experience the disheartenedness in the church. It shouldn't be there. To experience the bitterness in the church, it shouldn't be there. Paul is saying the church cannot lose heart because of its foundation, what it's built on. It's a community. It's a community of people who love one another share with one another, whose very life consists of ministry. God's holiness is given to Moses, to Jesus, even to you and I. Why? To be engaged in the larger work that God wants us to do. Ministry in a day-to-day -day life 
bringing more of our life under the will and purpose of God. It's not an extra. It's not an add-on. It is the way of living that the transformation and power of God comes to people. It operates for the sake of human dignity, social justice, heal creation, because God loved the world so much. So Paul says, that's our ministry here. And it is by God's mercy we do it. It's a gift given by God that enables us to be so humanly different in the world, not like what we are seeing in Eastern Europe. <coughs> the world is resistant and even dismissive of this ministry, and in its place, what do we have? Brutality, hatred, greed, ambition. And Paul says, don't lose heart. Because that's stuff on the net. We do not lose heart because the work, says Paul, is rooted in God's holiness and driven by His Spirit. No one can explain these stories and the holiness of God and the mountain, the transfiguration story. But here's what we can do we can hear them, we can listen to them, and we can discern what they're saying to us now. Next Sunday is the first Sunday of Lent. Lent leads to Good Friday. Good Friday leads to Easter Sunday. But today we are being prepared for those times ahead of us in the words of Paul. We are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another until we come face to face. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have called us to walk in the footsteps of your Son, to follow him on this journey. As we prepare for a season in which his passion is shown, help us to have the strength you give and the spiritual offer to walk with him to the cross. We pray in his name and for his sake. Amen. We're offering for gifts.
God of Moses, Peter, James, John, and so many servants over so many generations. We thank you for opening our eyes to your presence each day. Help us also to recognize that you're not only on the mountaintop, but here below, in everyday tasks and in times of challenge. Loving God, much in this world needs the transformation that only you can provide. Hear us this morning as we pray for the people of the Ukraine. Facing death and destruction at the hands of a desperate dictator, seeking glory and praise. Almighty God, where there is poverty, may food be sent. Where there is confusion, may wisdom be in place. Where there is chaos, May you create order. Where minds and hearts are troubled, bring comfort. And where pain is crippling people, grant release. Loving God, God of justice, move the hearts of the wealthy to share with those in need. Call the powerful to act with justice for those at risk. And give us, we pray, the will to work for the well-being of the earth and to live with respect for the fragile balances within your creation. O oh God, hear the cries of all who suffer and bring each one hope for the life with you. We pray for our congregation. Grant us the energy to shine wherever there is fear, despair, or discouragement. Bless us with vision as we face change. Renew our commitment to develop new forms of ministry for the days and years before us. And hear these prayers we offer as we offer them to Jesus who revealed your will to us and taught us to pray together say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For mine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Christ, whose glory fills the skies in the one sense. <laughs>
Christ's name we serve. Let us go in peace. And may the grace of God, the love of Christ, and the promptings of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore.